Hi, everybody. I think I'm live. Um, so much more confusing on a computer. Makes a lot more sense on my phone. Um, if you are here, please drop a hello in the comments. Um, also, so that I know that I'm live. And also um, to say hi. So this is a, a topic that I have talked about before. And I'm going to expand on it a little bit more today. Uh, it was a pretty popular live, so I'd like to readdress it and hopefully get a little bit more engagement and conversation because I think it's a really important topic. So uh, my name is Lorena. I am a animal trainer with Synergy Behavior Solutions. We are based out of Portland, Oregon. Um, I wore my flamingo shirt today, which is probably my favorite, but it's a little small on me, so I don't wear it all the time. Um, but I would appreciate any and all compliments related to my shirt. Um, so uh, I am doing running a class that starts um, pretty soon, like October uh, 29th, um, and it's called Wild Pups. And the goal of this class is to, it's kind of directed toward those folks who have dogs who seem to have a lot of energy. So that might be like a particular breed that is a working breed or that wiry, you know, long-legged, adolescent pup you adopted from the shelter that seems to need incessant exercise and is always looking around like this um or it would be a dog that has uh, struggling the struggles with like some behavior struggles so maybe you have a dog that is reactive on leash or a dog that has separation related behaviors um and a lot of the time and i think like historically the solution to a lot of these struggles and everyone and their uncle will tell you that your dog needs more exercise um it used to be um, a saying would that people would repeat would be like a tired dog is a good dog and um i understand where that comes from and i think that uh thank you amy i think so too <laughs> flamingos are actually really really cool animals if you don't know about them amy said flamingos rock and i agree and just an aside flamingos are considered um extreme organisms in that they can survive extremely high and low temperatures they routinely freeze their entire bodies overnight and then just wake up like nothing happened um they're really amazing you should read about some flamingos so anyway um what was i saying <sighs> things about dogs and exercise right so um i've been working with dogs for a few years now and i would say that and to be fair i do live in portland oregon which is a pretty dog friendly city and people who have dogs are pretty active and engaged with them so i come from kentucky and in kentucky i think that just a lot of the you know i lived in rural kentucky and the uh, the attitude and the culture of dogs is a little bit different so a lot of the folks who have or had dogs in the places that i grew up um in the place that i grew up dogs were just sort of like part of the farm and maybe it's sort of treated like furniture or an accessory just kind of like this is a thing that we have either because it serves a purpose um or it just like hangs out in the yard a lot they don't do a lot with their dogs um, and i'm not saying that's true about everybody in that space but it's definitely how i grew up um and how a lot of the people in my community grew up but in portland in particular and in places like portland and people who would be watching this live for sure is um it's true that I have actually never met a dog that isn't getting enough exercise. And in fact, I would argue that I have met more dogs that are getting far too much exercise. And there is absolutely too much of a good thing happening, especially with these kinds of dogs that seem to never run out of energy. Um, I call them wild pups. And um, they are, uh, that energy can come out in so many different ways. Melissa, I see your question. What about a dog that turns into a maniac every time you pet her? That's a very interesting comment. If you want to expand on that and describe exactly what you're talking about behaviorally, I would like to address it after I do my spiel, because um, that's an interesting um, phenomenon. So, um, yeah, so uh, it is absolutely possible to have too much of a good thing. And I would, um, I'd like to start this by saying that... Um, Yes, your dog needs exercise just like you need exercise, but chances are the behavior struggles that your dog has are not going to be resolved by more exercise and might actually be caused by too much exercise. So um, an analogy that is often used in, um, well, now in dog training, it's becoming pretty popular, especially because um, Absolute Dogs popularized it. And um, I am a big fan of Absolute Dogs and have uh, learned a lot of my training and theory from them. Um, but this is actually a, um, a concept that came around like in the late 90s or so. It's a metaphor um, from 
child, especially childhood um, psycho psychological development in the psych psychiatry world. Um, and it is the analogy of the stress bucket. So if we think of a metaphorical bucket that is slowly filled throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, or just randomly fluctuating levels of um, different stress triggers in the animal's life. So this is true for people, um, and it's true for, I would say, probably every animal, because every animal has different stress hormones running through their systems. And um, things that the, the thing about the bucket is that the bucket can be a variety of different sizes, depending on the individual. Um, and there is a hole in the bottom of the bucket out of which the bucket can empty. And an empty bucket is actually a good thing because that is an animal that is pretty emotionally regulated and is, um, and is able to cope with stress fairly well. So most of the dogs that I meet, and to be fair, at Synergy, we tend to work with um, more challenging behavior cases. And so a lot of the animals that I meet are animals whose buckets are overflowing. So what I mean by that is that these animals often have chronic stressors in their lives, and you might not even know what those stressors are. And so um, one of the things that, that I think about when I think about what sort of thing fills a dog's bucket is um, we're looking at things like uh, hormones such as like epinephrine, cortisol, adrenocortisol, these sort of things that create like a fight or flight response, the sort of things that make us good at sports, um, the sort of things that create an arousal response in the body. So that might be for humans like um, temperature rising a little bit, maybe like flushing cheeks, um, maybe your heart rate increases, your respiratory rate increases, um, your reaction time is faster, all of that indicates higher arousal. And so things that can fill the bucket um, for a dog create sort of the same thing, like panting, eyes getting wide, maybe pupils dilating, um, reactivity to the environment, whether that's like lunging, barking, or running away from things, or just noticing a lot of things and taking in um, a lot of stimuli, and um, and usually a faster response time. And so when we think about these sorts of hormones and how they function in the body, we have to look at what sort of things trigger those stress hormones. And the most interesting thing that I think I've found to be really helpful when thinking about the stress bucket is that both good and bad stress fill the bucket. So there's eustress and there is distress. And I think distress is something that we're really familiar with and it makes sense to us. So um, things that are scary, things that are painful, things that are really hard work, um, things that cause us anxiety, these are all things that create distress and dysregulation in our systems. Uh, but it's also true that eustress, so like euphoria and positive stress also fills the bucket because there's a very fine line between fear and excitement when we're talking about the valence of emotions. And when we're talking about epinephrine, cortisol, adrenocortisol, all of those hormones are involved either way. So when we talk about good stress with dogs, and let me just backtrack for a second, if we're talking about people, um, a kid being really scared on their first day of school and having a tantrum is obviously distress, you know, maybe like a five-year-old going to kindergarten for the first time. But that same five-year-old going to Disneyland for the first time and having an epic meltdown at the end of the day is a kid whose bucket is full from eustress. So too much um, positive stimuli, too much positive hormones, everything kind of comes crashing down. So um, or remains elevated for a long time, which I'll talk about in a minute. So um, when we're talking about dogs, especially, we are talking about uh, the types of exercise that tend to fill buckets. And one of the most common ways that I see that happening is people who endlessly play fetch. Chuck. 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 Chuck with their dogs. Especially because if you think about the, um, the mechanisms involved in playing that sort of just like, you know, an hour of chuck, chuck. Uh, with the ball is we're actually talking about activating the predatory chain in the animal. So chase is definitely part of that predatory chain. Chase, grab, maybe shake, and then um, bringing the ball back, uh, which is sort of part of the predatory chain. Um, we're actually looking at something that in the wild a canine might do like two or three times in a week. And here we are chucking this thing 50 or 60 times a day or every other day. Um, so Different conversation would be what that's doing to our dog's bodies, which is not great things in terms of like joints and healthy limbs and all of that. Um, but also the fact that we are getting that explosion of really intense hormones in the body constantly. And the same is true for, um, for dogs that are constantly just like running alongside you. Maybe you ride a bike or a skateboard and your dog just runs and runs and runs. So these animals are getting high intensity heart pumping exercise. Um, 
it's not doing good things for them. And chances are what it's doing is it's filling your dog's bucket and then you're creating this constantly overflowing bucket. And the behaviors that we often see are things like barking, lunging, pacing, inability to settle, chewing stuff up, jumping up on people, um, reactivity to the environment, uh, separation related behaviors, and all of those things feed back in and continue to fill that bucket. So we have this dog who's chronically stressed and there is a lot of research showing the negative effects of chronic stress in humans and the same is true for dogs. So it's really interesting when I, uh, even, even in the positive reinforcement dog training community, there's a lot of people who will say that this, like, uh, my client has a German short haired, po short haired pointer and that dog needs to run 10 miles a day. Or if you have a Husky, you better be prepared to run with it for eight miles and you can never let it off leash um, because all it wants to do is chase things. And people will say, um, uh, you have a Vishla, you better make sure that you are going to um, let that dog off leash run for two hours a day um, or you're gonna have a crazy animal in your house. And uh, while it's true that there are individual breeds that have individual needs, and it's true that genetics absolutely influence behavior, it is not true that these animals need any level of physical heart pumping exercise. And I see a lot of physical ailments and problems coming from that chronic stress that people then say are unique to the breed. When actually it's probably the chronic stress that is causing things like the rash all over your dog's body that you can never get rid of, or the allergies, or the um, sensitivity in their hind end, or the chronic ear infections, or whatever. Um, so thinking in terms of what does it mean to have a wild pup, and how do we access these dogs, and these are usually dogs that have incredible potential when it comes to uh, their ability to use their brains to solve problems, their ability to think independently and to accomplish tasks, and especially to use their noses. So, um, so my class is called Wild Pups, and yes, this is definitely a promo for my class, but it's also a way that I really want to continue to shift this conversation around this dog needs more exercise, this dog needs more exercise, this dog is a specific breed, so it needs this type of exercise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I have a, an American Staffordshire Terrier who can, who can and has hiked 12 miles up a mountain, 6,000 feet of elevation gain, come down and still had energy to spare. This dog can have all of the exercise in the world, and at the end of the day, she is a neurotic mess. And I know that about her, and so I know what fills her bucket, and we're very, very careful about what sort of activities she engages in. And by we, I mean she and I. So, um, so when we're thinking about what can we do with our wild pups, how can we replace that sort of like endless heart pumping exercise where we are really trying to achieve an exhausted dog so that we can take a break, exhaustion is not the same thing as calmness. So um, in my class, we're going to be going over stuff like um, the fact that fitness doesn't necessarily need to be super arousing and exciting, that there's lots of things you can do in the house to, uh, to work on your dog's um, physical fitness and uh, an ability to last for a long time uh, that isn't necessarily filling their bucket and that will also still make them tired. And um, we're going to be talking about a lot of scent work, how we engage our dog's brains more instead of this endless, mindless fetch or just running around in a cir in circles or playing constantly at the dog park, which is not a great thing for your dog for a variety of reasons, uh, which I have talked about in the past. You can look at my dog park live also. Um, but in terms of finding a variety of activities that engage all different levels and needs of our dog, um, it's super fun. It doesn't involve a huge amount of training knowledge. It just involves tapping into the sorts of things your dog loves to do anyway. So instead of this sort of like narrow obsession with how do we get more exercise, how do we meet the dog's physical exercise needs, instead it's more how do we meet all of the dog's mental and physical needs in a way that is well balanced and how can that we make that a unique plan for each dog. Um, yeah. So this is something that I tend to geek out on a lot and I will talk about a lot, but I will say also, just as an aside, one of the things we'll be focusing on is shaping calmness as a skill. So that uh, if you do have a dog who is a wild pup who tends to have a lot of energy, you will find that by teaching the dog to be calm, you do not need to make it run for three hours a day. It will just choose calmness as a default. Uh, but it's a pretty incredible process in terms of your dog learning that calmness feels good. And that way we get a dog that is able to empty their bucket on their own and self-regulate. Uh, we can resolve so many behavior struggles if we just maybe stop endlessly walking the dog, maybe stop endlessly playing fetch and instead engage other aspects of the dog's body and brain. Um, cool. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to just check in on Melissa's question again. Um, 
Uh, hi, Kristen. Um, so Melissa says, uh, my dog allows the petting at first, but then starts to fling her head and body around. Pounces around, wiggles, bites, rubs her body on you, almost knocking you down. Seems to become way overstimulated by the attention and touch. Yeah, that sounds accurate. Um... I have a lot of different thoughts on that, but because I don't know you and your dog, the first thing that I would say is um, it sounds like it would be really helpful to teach your dog that touch doesn't have to continue after she initiates the interaction. So with dogs like this, I might um, interact with them for three seconds, like one, two, three, and then remove my hands and ignore them. Um, if they continue to solicit attention calmly, then I will do another three seconds and then break away and ignore them. Um, it sounds like your dog could generally benefit from some chafing calmness. And also I will say that just because a dog is soliciting attention doesn't necessarily mean they want it. Uh, which sounds confusing, but I think that a lot of the dogs that I interact with, um, you know, dogs are, this is already technically past my time, but I'm going to talk about it because I think it's interesting. So dogs are evolutionarily predisposed to avoid conflict with humans. So when they get into a space of emotional conflict where they don't necessarily want an interaction, a lot of them aren't really really very good at disengaging, so just walking away, because that's like most of the dogs I work with have no idea that that's even an option, and that's where we get a lot of challenging behaviors. Um, but also the fact that um, you've probably heard of fight or flight. There's actually a lot of Fs. So there's like fight, flight, flirt, fawn, freeze, all of these different theoretical... Um, behaviors, not even theoretical, they're very real, behaviors that happen when an animal is, um, uh, perceives themselves to be in danger or is experiencing stress, uh, so spike in that stress hormone, and I find that a lot of dogs will choose flirt when they're stressed, which looks like jumping up, licking, ears pinned back, lots of, like, kind of maniacal seeking attention. I see a lot in puppies and adolescent dogs, and often their owners will say, oh, my dog loves people, or my dog loves other dogs, and I see a dog that is actually stressed and is trying to communicate that stress in a way that is, um, is as pro-social as possible. So um, sometimes that's a dog that really actually just needs a little break and needs some distance from whatever um, the environment is or even from the person that they're interacting with, which could be you. My dog definitely does that. Um, I've had to really work on following my pit bull's very subtle signals that she wants to be close, but she doesn't necessarily want to be touched. These are very different things. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope I see you all in my class. Feel free to register um, via the link. I posted it in the caption of the video, and um, you can also post any questions or comments about it in the... Um, Oh, I, she said, how do we sign up for the class? Just like this. Uh, I'm going to post the link in there, and then also um, you can ask any questions about the class in the comments. And otherwise, please share this video. I think this is really important information that I want to create more conversations around. And um, there's way more to say about it. This is just kind of like an introduction. But I think that uh, my Wild Pups class is a great option for you to start to explore some um, really some other levels of interaction and engagement that you can have with your dog. Um, thank you all for joining me and have a lovely day.